Hi, this is going to be the third part in my in-depth series on how ThrowRock was programmed. I changed my uh, text editor window a little bit to be more how I normally do things on my primary computer, and this takes up more screen space and is probably better. Anyway, so this should be a little more readable. Font size is the same, hopefully that's good enough. I feel like this is a good balance between fitting an amount of text on screen and characters being large enough to see. Anyway, so uh, last two episodes we sort of looked at a bunch of system code for just initializing an application with an OpenGL context and uh, how to talk to the system APIs for all the things we need for that. Let's get to the actual game code. So I got as far as target init. This function is called when Windows or whatever platform I'm running on has set up all the stuff and opened a window and is ready for me to do stuff with it. So throw rock here, main.c and throw rock. Uh, it's target init, right? So this is already registered callbacks and stuff. Um, what this needs to do when we boot up the application uh, between that black window and this actually drawing, music playing, input being listened to, etc. Uh, here's what it does. First, it initializes gamepads. Um, I'm not going to go into my gamepad API in detail. Just it's kind of like uh, an extension on the event handling from shell. Um, but yeah, talks to the device driver and sets up things. So basically I get a callback for when a gamepad is attached to the computer, when one is removed, when a button on a gamepad is pressed, when a button is released, and when an axis is moved, like a stick or a trigger or something. Sometimes D-pads count as axes, like one for left, right, one for up, down. Sometimes they count as buttons. It just depends on what the the gamepad driver decides to do. Gamepad drivers are complicated. There's a lot I could say about that, but I think that's something not to focus on here. <laughs> so just know they're kind of complicated. Uh, so I create a few global objects which will be referenced in several different places in the code. Game session. Let's start with you. So game session is a name that'll be familiar to those of you who have followed uh, my Foresight Fight devlog. Basically, this is a global object that just contains a bunch of stuff about the execution of the program, uh, various sub-objects that uh, keep track of players, state, their preferences, their progress, and just some stuff that binds things together. So let's start with game session. Okay, so here in main. Right, I guess I need to talk about my object system. So this is C, it's not C++. I have a uh, home-built uh, object orientation paradigm. The basics of it are just that there is a struct. <laughs> These are, it's, there's a bunch of macros. It's a little bit complicated. Like it's, it's hard to tell what you're looking at when you just look at this text. But just think of this as, um, this. So basically this uh, this define gets interpreted as uh, the definition of a struct game session which contains these things. This is the contents of um, its parent object which is stem object. So that's how I do uh, instance variable inheritance. I just define struct contents, include the parent contents in there. So anything that were to subclass game session would use game session ivars at the top, then append struct fields at the bottom. So that's that's how I do that. There are other ways to do that. This is this macro approach is how I do it. Anyway, yeah, so it contains whatever a stem object contains, which is almost nothing, uh, just a couple of uh, variables about its lifetime and memory management and stuff. Uh, and then a bunch of object references. I don't need to go through all these right now. Let's instead, the reason I needed to mention this now was because I'm calling game session create whose definition is just another macro. Um, this macro, I mean, I can show what it does just in case. Uh, stem project, stem object. Ooh, here's gonna be a very unreadable header file. Yeah, okay, stem object create implementation. Uh, local variable of the type of um, the object being operated on. So I have this defined at the top of an object implementation file to say this is the game session implementation file. Uh, I have virtual functions. Here's some macros that are about that. Dispose is the only virtual function that uh, game session implements. 
allocate space, set its function table to the static um, function table of that keeps all the function pointers for virtual methods that can be called on game session, which is just dispose in its case. Anyway, it's a bunch of macros, it's complicated. Um, the only part that needs to be understood for this is that you call create, you get back an initialized game session object with these struct contents. And when that initializes, it calls games, where the heck is init? Oh, that's not how you spell init. Calls game session init in order to let this object initialize itself. So uh, this calls stem object init uh, with a little bit of stuff that that does, which is not much. Anyway, so create a preferences object. So preferences is just the name of the thing that is the container for all user settings or things that I want to treat like user settings. Uh, the paradigm I have for preferences is when I create the object, I set defaults on it. This both establishes what the default value for each setting is and what the settings themselves are. So preferences set, uh, key play sound. This is just, let's see, where do I keep that? Is that in game session .h? It's not. Is that in shared definitions? That's way up here. You should be, oh geez, my alphabetization is not right. That's a pain to fix. Give me a second. Okay, that's better. I don't know if Sublime Text has a sort alphabetically option here. I don't think it does. So I just have to do it manually. Anyway, so uh, shared definitions. It's not here. Um, where's that defined? It's really not in game session? Globals.h? No. I have a bunch of header files that define a bunch of global stuff. Maybe too many. How is it in none of these? It's not in this file. I don't have a preferences specific file here. Huh, that's weird. I would think this would be obvious. Wait, is it defined in game session itself? Yeah, here we go, because uh, game session actually acts as an API barrier for accessing the preferences object. So only it needs to know what the actual preference keys are. Okay, cool. So anyway, these are strings. Uh, eventually those get written out to disk in some sort of, can I open this file? Let's see, that would be my home directory. Oh boy, that is not, I don't like the way this looks. Where I think this ends up going is app data, roaming, uh, throw rock preferences dot JSON. Here we go. So here's what the file ends up actually looking at. This is my preference file. You. I don't like the way this looks at all. Oh, this is gross. Look at all this wasted space. Well, okay. There's a reason that this is the way that it is. It's not something really meant to be looked at directly, I guess. Ugh. Anyway, somewhere in here, there. There's play music. Full screen, checkerboard grass, checkerboard water. These are in a random order because they're in a hash table that... Uh, might shuffle its keys around as the hashing algorithm determines. Anyway, so here's the very ugly preferences file. Uh, uh, ugh, I don't wanna look at this or think about it. <laughs> Let's talk about it at a higher level than that. Anyway, so in the preferences API, I just say there is a key called play underscore sound, uh, which is initially set to the Boolean of true. So play sound defaults to true, play music defaults to true and is a setting that can be changed. Sound volume is an unsigned int, uh, eight bits, uh, sorry, eight, yes, eight bits wide. Uh, doesn't need to be any larger than that. Um, 10, music volume defaults to seven. So yeah, that's just a number between zero and 10 that's interpreted as a level of volume. Uh, and that's how it looks in the game. So the preferences on disk reflect uh, these values. Anyway, uh, so full screen, true or false, uh, checkerboard grass, checkerboard water, repeat delay, repeat interval. My key repeat uh, in throw rock settings need some work. I know there is one weird thing I can do here where, okay, so I'm gonna press down and keep holding down. So that's what it does. Um, if I set, I can do something weird if I set the interval high and the delay low. Yeah, so the, 
the first repeat happens quick, then the, the, uh, I just like add those two numbers together. That would make more sense. Anyway, um, I'll show, uh, yeah, so the defaults are pretty good. If, if you really want to go faster, you know, you can. Zoom. <laughs> uh, I guess I thought it was important to have settings for that, but just never, never got to the point of actually tweaking them to feel nice. Anyway, it's fine. So yeah, uh, and then pick up and throw. Uh, that's a preference for whether you would like. So right, I'm holding the action key and I'm pressing left. And now I'm throwing that rock in the same key press that picked it up. So if I change that setting for throw during pickup, I'm holding the action key, I'm pressing right, and I'm moving instead of throwing. So that's what that one does. So I have to release and repress if I want to throw. Uh, this was the way I had it initially. Uh, eventually I added the setting to have it the other way for uh, people who preferred that. I don't know which I prefer. The problem is like, sometimes I want one, sometimes I want the other. The game can't read my mind to know which one I want. <laughs> so I just kind of have this halfway in between compromise. Really, this game probably could do with a different control scheme entirely. I don't know what, but yeah, there are some, some compromises in the ones that it has, the one that it has, it's fine. Anyway, so I establish my preference keys, establish the default values, uh, then I ask the preferences API where its file path would be, and that would be this location on disk. So on Windows, it's users folder, app data, roaming, uh, the name that I provide there, which is preferences file name, which is throwrockpreferences.json. Uh, then I decide uh, that that is a JSON file, so I use a JSON deserialization context there. Point that at a file path. This is an object which implements a uh, shared API for serialization. Basically, like, um, let's see, data value deserialize. Okay, there's several levels of indirection here. So that JSON file is not really read directly as JSON by throw rock. What it does is it uses my dynamic types API. So that's why this has all this weird extra stuff here to say that play music is of type Boolean and true is the value there. Uh, hmm. Hmm. It's a little hard to explain, but basically I get something called a data value that can hold any type of object or hierarchical collection of objects, which in this case is a structure, uh, which is saying just like logically treat it like a struct with fields. Um, and these are the fields. The fields are checkerboard grass, play music, full screen, you know, that's a Boolean, that's a Boolean, that's a Boolean, that's a uint8, uh, this is its value, etc. cetera. Uh, and then I can navigate that tree of data and pull out uh, the appropriate typed um, information as necessary. But the API that does that is preferences. So I just uh, deserialize a file. Um, so the reason this is as verbose as it is in throw rock code is that preferences itself doesn't care that this file is JSON on disk. This file could be uh, stored in a binary format. And I would just switch that out by doing say, this, um, just use a different implementation of deserialization context, which reads and writes binary files. Um, you know, and change a couple of more things like rename this, change the dispose. Um, but yeah, so basically preferences doesn't have to care how its data is stored on disk. It just has an interface for reading and writing it. And here this decides which interface to use and it chooses JSON which has the advantage that if I go dig in up this file on my file system, it's human readable. I can just come in here and change this. Like if something has gone super wrong, there's something wrong with my graphics drivers. On my operating system, there's a bug that causes going into full screen mode to, uh, to just lock up the display and I can't do anything. And oops, I turned on full screen mode and throw rock and now I can't play it anymore. So you could just delete this preference file or you could come in here and change this from what was true to false or false to true or whatever. Uh, so, you know, there are little advantages like that. If this were a binary file, editing this wouldn't be so possible. But I mean, probably makes more sense just to delete the file because it'll get recreated anyway. So anyway, that's 
choice of relatively little consequence. So right, if I'm able to create the deserialization context with this file path, um, this is a stem library, uh, preferences is a stem library, JSON serialization is another stem library, that's where these implementations are, not invented for throw rock, just used by us. Uh, so if I'm able to open that file, the file exists and is JSON and can be parsed by this API, then I try to do a second parse as data value. So, you know, just so this isn't like some arbitrary JSON file, it has some other stuff in it. It's specifically formatted in a way that data value understands. Uh, ooh, that's fine. And also that I can get a hash table out of it. Sure, I guess a structure is interpreted as a hash table. That's fine. Uh, if all of that stuff succeeds, the file exists, the file is formatted correctly, the file parses, then I call preferences import. So basically I pass to the preferences object this table of interpreted data, which then overwrites the default values that I put here with whatever is in the file here. So that's how preferences that are saved to disk uh, are read back. And I can skip ahead for a moment save preferences. Doing it the opposite way is uh, as you'd expect. I create a serialization context instead of a deserialization one. I ask preferences what my file path should be. Create the serialization context, turn this into a data value. So yeah, preferences export instead of import. That just creates a big uh, table of data that can be interpreted this way and is interpreted by data value, which serializes it to the serialization context. That turns it into JSON data, uh, which then I can tell it to write to the file path that preferences told me. Uh, and if that fails for some reason, like if you don't have write permission to your preferences directory on your computer, you'll probably have bigger problems, but if you manage to run throw rock in that situation, you'll get a message in your console about it, which you can't read because I only ship the uh, x86-64 version of this game, which Minji W builds don't allow console output to go anywhere for some reason. Like only the, this is why you saw this, if you watched again, my uh, Foresight Fight um, uh, uh, devlog. So I double click this and I get a console window here. Here's where my standard out and standard error messages go. But I don't know, that's a limitation of the uh, MinGW and or the Windows, uh, actually, I don't even know what it is. I think it's a MinGW thing. Anyway, yeah, so for 64-bit applications, which is the only way I'm shipping this uh, right now, um, I have build for 32-bit. I could could upload this to my website if I wanted to, but but yeah, only only 64-bit is actually there. Uh, anyway, yeah, so, <laughs> so this goes to a place that uh, end users can't see on Windows. Uh, other platforms you might be able to get a hold of it anyway so yeah just save preferences doing the opposite of uh loading preferences there pretty much so preferences are loaded uh, i have an object in memory tracked by game session which knows whether i want checkerboard what my sound volume is and all that stuff um oh separately i also have an input map file. Ah, just because this is sort of a different system from preferences. Well, but it's part of the same one. Kind of. Okay, so it's stored in the same place. This is my key bindings and gamepad uh, configurations. Uh, so if preferences knows about custom key mappings in some way, uh, as in, this is not the first launch and the user has changed that and it's gotten saved to disk. Then I do some similar stuff as we saw above to create something called an input map. So let's look at input map. Will this be readable at all? Let's find out. Input controller, source, input controller, input map.h. Uh, so an input map has a bunch of keyboard bindings. You can bind key modifiers without other keys and it's different. Uh, or you can bind, right, keys with key modifiers. Like if, you know, control S is supposed to save a file, for example, but you don't want control or S on its own to do something. Anyway, uh, 
game pads and right there's a mechanism for saying like these two game pads are logically the same thing like say an xbox 360 controller and an xbox one controller might use different identifiers when plugged in but they should be treated as the same thing because their their drivers map them the same way uh yeah and this just stores associations like say uh the key code of key code s as we saw in shell key codes before uh is associated with the action identifier of whatever I specify externally. So how do I specify those? Uh, right, I load that from disk. Um, and if it's there, I, sorry, if it's not there, I set up a default one. So bind default controllers. That one will be an input map defaults, a separate file just because it's a, a bunch of data that I don't want polluting my game session file. So uh, if I need to create a mapping of inputs to actions, this is the default way that it does it. So we got some like gamepad, vendor, and product IDs uh, for the, the two, well, yeah, two types of controllers that I recognize. So I recognize DualShock 4 specifically, and then three different Xbox controllers. And like I was saying, all of these Xbox controllers are aliased to each other. So Xbox 360 controllers uh, uh, bindings are the ones that are set up. If you have Xbox One, uh, it looks like that. If you have Xbox SX, the again, what the driver reports is the same, so the mapping can, can be shared. But first we set up key bindings. So the default key bindings for the left input, by the way, the, these are constants that are defined in my atom list. So let me define what an atom is. <laughs> This is probably hard to follow. Sorry, I'm doing my best, but there's only so much I can do. So anyway, an atom is a string constant that is the actual string that it represents, but also is pointer comparable. Because like in C, if I were to say... Uh, if I did that, I would have two variables that both contain the string hello, but the actual pointer values of these are different. They have different memory addresses. Or at least they can. They could be the same address, but they're probably different addresses, especially if I did this. That sort of declares my intent to change what these are. Um, anyway, so... Uh, so uh, what, a, what an atom does is it gives me strings so I can operate them as strings, you know, I can print them or whatever. Uh, but they are guaranteed to be the same address if it's the same contents. Anyway, so just this is a string that is input left. Uh, that's defined here. And so you'd include atoms.h, which does some preprocessor magic. Um, using this atom list.h, which is my list of uh, every pointer comparable string constant that is used in throw rock. So this is a whole list, a whole list of calls to a macro that is to be defined when this file is included. Because yeah, C preprocessor is super cool. It can do stuff like um, basically the include command uh, here, this one, just pastes the content of this file logically into, uh, to replace this entire line. So it is what the compiler sees is this. So the compiler sees that, which means that I have said define atom is a macro, which expands to extern atom, atom, uh, this is string concatenation, whatever the, uh, the name is. So you end up with this turning into that. So each of those lines is replaced oops, with uh, a declaration that there is something of type atom, which is just defined to const car star, I think. Uh, you are here. Utilities, atom.h. Uh, type def, const car star, atom. Yes. Okay. Uh, anyway. So, uh, so yeah, just ends up with a list of string constant variables, basically, that get linked in at, uh, at link time. Uh, the actual one authoritative definition is in here. Um, 
using a, uh, what's this actually called? This is sort of a GCC uh, declaration that this function should be called at startup of the application, which um, uh, regardless of whether I actually call it manually or not. So I won't call this manually. This just will happen when the program starts. So I guess we didn't cover everything that happens when the program starts. So the attribute constructor with all these extra symbols around it is called at program startup time and it says to the atom system, uh, these are the string constants I want to define. Uh, so whenever you say, uh, whenever you refer to this symbol, it is this one pointer that's known ahead of time. Anyway, uh, so we're off on oops, several tangents here. Let's get back to reality, the interesting parts at least. So we were in input map, yeah, but we're done with that. So game session, input map defaults, right. So anyway, so I bind the action of input left to the key code of left arrow key. Input right is bound to right arrow key. Up, up, down, down, action defaults to X, wait defaults to C, undo defaults to Z, reset defaults to R. And then uh, gamepad drivers report different things per platform. So on a Mac for the Xbox 360 controller, the binding that I want to be the left action is axis zero negative. Uh, and I want that to trigger, I, I guess this is, this might be an analog stick. So if you tilt your analog stick, the left analog stick to the left, uh, an amount specified by, I guess you're in the header file. Yeah, so you tilt your left analog stick left in the negative direction uh, at least 75%. And then the game will interpret that as I am pressing to the left. Then uh, there's a, I don't want this to just, if, if like you hovered your thumb right at 75%, um, there might be a little bit of noise that might get a whole bunch of like presses and releases if I'm using that as an exact threshold. So once you've crossed that threshold and it's said, okay, left is currently being pressed. For left to stop being pressed, I have to go back down to 62.5%. So go back off. Uh, by about, what is that, an eighth? Yeah. Back off by an eighth of the uh, the sticks range, or I guess a sixteenth since it goes both ways. Uh, an eighth of the range from center to all the way left. Uh, and then it will consider left to stop being pressed. That is what I'm declaring here. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, if it is a D-pad that's acting as a pair of axes, then it just goes straight from zero to 100% when you press down the D-pad. So this this threshold, trigger and release threshold still, still works the same. So whether this is a D-pad or an analog stick, I can't tell from here. Uh, I, I would know if I like opened up a driver viewer and checked which is which. Um, but anyway, so I just bind that to those. Uh, yeah, okay, since I'm binding buttons, it looks like on a Mac with an Xbox 360 controller, the left stick has its x-axis identified as axis zero. Negative is to the left. Positive is to the right. Uh, axis ID one. Uh, negative is upward. Positive is downward. And then the D-pad, I can just tell from looking at this, uh, is buttons seven for left, eight for right, five for up, six for down. Let's compare that to say Windows, where, okay, the sticks are the same. Left is negative axis zero, right is positive axis zero, down is negative axis one, up is positive axis one. Uh, looks like D-pad still counts as buttons, but it's two, three, zero, one. So up is zero, down is one, left is two, right is three. But then on the Mac, up is five, down is six, left is seven, right is eight. So same order, but just there are four or five other things before this on the Mac for some reason. Uh, anyway, yeah, so that's just down to what uh, gamepad drivers report. Can be anything at all. It's complicated. 
Uh, and then other buttons on the gamepad. The action button is the, the bottom face button on an Xbox controller, identifies itself as number 16 on the Mac. On Windows, it identifies itself as number 10. On Linux, is it the same? No, that's identified as number zero. Yeah, see, so it's, it's different for each one. And on Linux, it looks like the gamepad, sorry, the D-pad is actually an axis value. So anyway, uh, I need all this flexibility just to be able to make things appear to be the same everywhere across uh, platforms and different controllers. So this is the, the mechanism that sets up that mapping. Well, this is the data of the mapping. Uh, the mechanism is, is elsewhere. Anyway, so uh, those are my defaults. Have I mentioned gamepads are extremely complicated? <laughs> There's a lot to them. <laughs> it is not a simple thing to have gamepad support. I had to, had to figure this all out myself from scratch. The, the actual APIs for talking to these things are even worse. Anyway, but it's, it's there, it works mostly, it has a few issues, but it's, it's good enough. So right, sorry, we're in game session. Okay, so that's the input map. Uh, by default controllers if it's not defined, otherwise just use the user's specified binding. Then I create this input controller object. So here's where I specify which uh, atom strings can be, uh, can be used for the game. Uh, so this is a variadic function, just takes however many parameters I pass to it until I give it the null terminator here. Um, so yeah, input controller, if we looked at that, I don't have input map up here anymore, that's fine. Uh, stemlib projects, input controller, input controller dot h, uh, dot dot dot, attribute sentinel. So another GCC marker just to say that if I forget that null there at the end, it won't know when to stop reading. And with the sentinel attribute on there, the, the compiler will warn, warn me about that if, I, if I've done this and not specified where the end of the argument list is. Anyway, so uh, update repeat rate. What's that mean? Okay, so this right here is my interpretive mapping from those integer ranges of the user preferences of repeat rate and interval into actual second values. So 0.06 seconds is the fastest repeat, 0.1 seconds is the fastest uh, repeat delay. So on the default, it when you press a key or a button or an axis, whatever is interpreted as a directional movement, it will wait 0.22 seconds. I wonder how I arrived at this value. I, I probably just picked some numbers and tweaked it until it felt right. <laughs> Uh, it will wait for 0.22 seconds. Then if you're still holding the thing every 10th of a second, it will input that same action again until you release the direction. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a mechanism built into input controller. I just say, yeah, so this is just an oblique way of referencing the item in that array that I defined here. These could be they could be that. It doesn't actually matter. But I guess just like whenever I call this function, that's going to be pushed into the stack. If I did it this way, it'll just sit there in program memory and not have to be reinitialized. Anyway, that's not not a not an important distinction, really. Anyway, um, so yeah, so just set that as the repeat rate. Then next. Android, iPhone Simulator, iPhone OS. Okay, this is leftover code from Foresight Fight, which also didn't operate on any of these. That's not true. I built it for Android once, years ago. Yeah, so this is leftover Foresight Fight code for if you're using a touch device, then uh, this will detect that and assume it's that. If you are... Ah, okay, so this is interesting. So on a desktop platform... If there is a gamepad connected, it assumes that you want to play with a gamepad. Otherwise, it assumes you want to play with a keyboard. This doesn't really do anything as far as Throw Rock is concerned. But if I were like, yeah, okay, so what this would do, um, an example of how this would be used is when an application first starts up, if I'm like, say, on some sort of title screen and I want to put on screen, press this button or key in order to continue and show like a graphic of a gamepad button or the, the name of a key on, on your keyboard, I would check this variable to know whether I want to show gamepad 
control graphics or keyboard control graphics. So as soon as I press a key, I think I have a system somewhere for changing this to input device keyboard. As soon as I do something on my gamepad that uh, has an effect, I change it back to input device gamepad. So this is more relevant in Foresight Fight, where there's mouse inputs, where things actually look a lot different from if you're gamepadding or keyboarding. Uh, here, it's just, just kind of extra. Um, anyway, so then resource manager. This is an object which, uh, well, sure, it manages resources, but what does that mean? A resource manager is basically the object that I talk to when I want to load a supporting file for the game. I pass a function pointer to shell get current time? Okay, I have my reasons. They have nothing to do with throw rock. Let's ignore this. <laughs> Not relevant. Uh, okay, so it looks like I have a system set up here where I create this object. I tell it, if I were to say, hey, resource manager, I want to load the file called fenced.json because uh, I want to parse it as a level file and display it to the user. Um, it knows, all right, so here, this file path, file path to the executable plus resources directory plus the string you're requesting is within my search paths. So somewhere I'm going to be able to say resource manager, uh, reference resource, I think is the name of the thing, pass it the string fenced.json, and then it will know how to find that file on disk from this. Uh, yeah, this just gets the, uh, right, we looked at this. This is in shell. It returns the file path to this directory. So anyway, that's a, a search path. And then this is kind of like input and map defaults, but a little different. I have this file called resource wiring. Add type handlers. This is all just kind of organizational stuff just so I can do things conveniently in other parts of the code. Uh, I tell resource manager that if I'm loading something that I identify as a ping file, you're gonna use these callbacks. If I'm loading a texture atlas, you use those. If I'm loading a bitmap font, stem audio, stem music. So those are the types of files I load. I guess I don't have a binding here for level files. I load those a different way, not using the resource manager. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, anyway, and these are just implementations that know how to take a file path, or actually a resource name. Oh, interesting. Not a file path. Right. So this gets complicated on platforms where I can't necessarily just take a file path anywhere in the file system. Mostly uh, pocket computers, smartphones are like this. But anyway, I might need to map this differently. Create with resource file, resolve file path. So that's the function that turns fence.json into C projects, throw rock, build, main app, release windows, x86, 64 resources, uh, fence.json, etc with, you know, path, path separators put in there as appropriate. Uh, so yeah, this just is file IO code similar to what we saw for loading preferences, just create a deserialization context, try to deserialize if you can. Uh, right, load sub resources because I happen to be looking at bitmap font, which references a texture atlas, which is another resource I have to load. So that would go call this. Anyway, yeah, just get file path, parse what's there, give it back. Uh, is an implementation of that for each type of resource I can load. So we're back in game session. Input control, you go away. I'm probably going to want to open that up again. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so this sets up an object that I can use to load easily things in this directory. Uh, event dispatcher. I wonder if I use that. I'm not sure if I do. Let's assume for now that I don't, and if I do, I'll explain it then. <laughs> UI appearance, I know I don't use this. So there's a UI toolkit that I use for Foresight Fight, for Tile Editor, for Audio Lab. I've gone over that in great detail in those projects. It's not used here, so I won't talk about it here. This is just leftover code. Ignore this. Level progress, this is game code. So level progress, this is another object kind of like preferences. Uh, so this keeps track of I guess all Throw Rock needs to know is which levels are clear and which levels have had a secret ac uh, exit accessed. So that's all it keeps, just a list of level identifiers, two lists of level identifiers that those two properties are true for. So I create one which initializes itself to have nothing in its list 
And then I... Right, yeah, game session wants to know what the default level to choose on startup should be. So that's what these are going to determine. Uh, right, get file path. I do this a little more directly. I don't go through the serialization API. I just say this is a JSON file. I'm going to load it as JSON and handle it that way. So level progress, instead of talking to a serialization API, just talks directly to JSON and navigates my parsed JSON subtree uh, to say, okay, so if there's an object at the top level, iterate over its values. If this is an array and its key is levels, just sanity checks to make sure that the file that I am loading is a level progress file. So, you know, this will fail to load if you mess with your level progress and make a mistake. <laughs> you know, you can go in and uh, like change. The, okay, so where, where is this kept again? It's in here, app data, roaming, throw rock, save.json. Right, yeah, so this just is a list of all of the level identifiers in the game uh, and the ones that I've exited secretly from. So, you know, if, you're, uh, if you start the game and quit it, you're going to end up with a file there that looks, oops, that looks like this. And if you know the level identifiers, you could cheat your way to uh, having cleared the first level by inputting that string there. You could tell the game, hey, I've made a secret exit on the intro level, even though that's impossible by doing this. I think I have some handling for that. It's nothing interesting. It'll just, just not do anything. Um, but yeah, anyway. So uh, that's how that file's interpreted. Um, and yeah, this just walks the JSON subtree and sets these as appropriate in its own internal representation of what it knows about level clears based on what the, what's in that file. And that's, we don't need to go over that in detail. It's obvious enough what it does, I think. Uh, and right, then it asks after that progress has been parsed, what would be a sensible one to start on? So here's getting into some actual game logic. So get earliest unsolved level. There's uh, basically I want to take the user to the place that makes the most sense. So, so how does that work? Uh, get earliest level non-secret count. So in the uh, in this list of thirteen non-secret levels. Uh, if there's an unsolved one of those, even if there are also unsolved secrets, it's going to take you to the first one, the, sorry, the, yeah, the first unsolved one in this list, if there are any. So, you know, I've solved the first 10 levels. Um, I also have found the secret exit in shooting range. I have not solved ice keep. So yeah, let's, let's say the two levels I have open that I could work on are pillars and ice keep. Uh, this is where I have the logic that says you probably want to go to pillars first and not worry about the secret, at least by default when you start up. That's what I'm going to assume. So if there is an uncleared one, the first one uncleared, counting from zero to the, the count, uh, if there's one of those, then that's the one I'm going to choose. Then after that, if there is a level... Oh, interesting. Huh. Oh, this is something that I think I would probably want to decide the other way around. So after basic clear on a level, it assumes... Okay, so once again, in this situation, let's say I have 1 through 13 all cleared. I've cleared Ice Keep. I have unlocked Sanctum. I have not unlocked Trap Door. So what this is going to say... No, 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 this is the right way around. I was misinterpreting. So if there is a secret clear on the level, so basically if on, in the left column I have found a way outside the level boundaries and unlocked something to its right, and that level exists, so, you know, if you've hacked your uh, level progress to say, I found a secret exit on the intro level, it's not going to recommend a non-existent level to you. Uh, if that level exists and that secret level is not clear, then that's going to be the one that it, uh, that it chooses to do. 
Uh, these are just two out variables that uh, say basically this is the row index here and the other one is the column index. So it's either column zero or column one. That's an easy way to think about it. Uh, right, yeah. So in that situation I described ice keep, or sorry, sanctum would be the one chosen because ice keep is clear. Uh, then after that, if every secret level that I have found has been cleared and a secret level exists in something I know about, then that's the level you'll be taken to. Yeah, so let's say you found the shooting range secret and cleared it. You found the chilled secret and cleared it. You didn't find the pillars secret. Uh, when you start up the game, you'll be taken to pillars in order to find the secret. So that's how that logic works. And if all of that fails, uh, as in if you don't have any level progress, it just defaults to the first one. Row zero, column zero. So uh, that's that game logic. Okay, and that's the end of game session initialization. So back to main.c. Uh, we initialized a game session, great. Uh, initialize a renderer. I'll talk about the renderer subsystem in another one of these. We're not focusing on that now, but we'll get there. Anyway, yeah, so just set up the means to draw graphics. Uh, tell it that that's how big you want to draw it. Um, this is creating the uh, the off-screen um, whatever size. Like if I if I take a screenshot here, uh, right? It's creating the 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 off-screen texture buffer of of this pixel dimension, which will then be drawn into at at its native size and stretched to fill the the window. Uh, that's what the, the render target is. So it creates one of those at display width, display height. Uh, creates a screen manager. This is irrelevant to throw rock, so let's ignore it. Uh, what this would be is a way to handle, like if I had, um, Audio Lab is a good example of this. I have the synthesizer screen, the music composition screen, the SFX screen, and the audio editor screen. So that's just setting up a container object for those four things. But Throw Rock has only one screen. It's the gameplay screen. The, the menu can be overlaid over it, but it's, it's all the same screen. Uh, some gamepad management, uh, audio stuff. Oh, I don't initialize the audio subsystem until later. That's interesting. Okay. So gamepads are set up right away. Well, then this shouldn't be set up yet. Not until audio is, uh, oh, this is all wrong. Oh, you are incorrect. Audio timer ID should not be established until I have actually, actually that shouldn't exist if audio is disabled either. Yeah, this needs to go here. I'm not sure how, let's see, how could that bug manifest? Sorry, the function I'm in now, um, basically, I want to return from target init as quick as, well, it never returns. I want to call shell main loop as quick as possible um, because if I don't, I get this ugly blank white window. I want to be able to erase it to black. Uh, Foresight Fight takes advantage of this better because it starts with a black window and then sort of fades into the, the game contents. Um, hello. I want this. So you can see for a moment there is a black window as Windows does its opening window animation, then I see the game screen. Uh, so basically, if I am too slow in doing my initial setup, the window opening animation is actually white instead of black here, and it's very jarring if I have a black clear color background. Um, it's, it's very jarring to have that change from white to black. So I want to finish this as quick as possible so I can do my first draw command where I clear the window to black uh, before I do setup that might do like a little more file IO or advanced parsing or talking to audio hardware which can take a moment that's why that part is deferred anyway yeah so that's that's why target init wants to do as little as possible that's why audio timer shouldn't be there because audio is done later anyway yeah so gamepad timer is fine I initialized gamepads I could do this later why don't I do that later because game session does gamepad things with the input map, that's why. Yes, this input map needs to know whether gamepads are connected. So I have to initialize them before I do this. And I have to do this before I do the rest. So yeah, this is in the correct order. But that audio timer needed to go up there. Okay. 
Uh, right, so I just have a regular tick to pull the gamepad subsystem to see what state has changed, like if a button has been pressed or an axis has been moved, I just need to call uh, gamepad event timer. Yeah, just gamepad process events. Just This is just, I need to need to call this periodically in order for gamepad events to do their things. Uh, input controller also, oh, no, this is correct. Key repeat is a system thing. So if I hold my A key right now, you know, that repeats. That's part of the system API. I actually get key down events from that. Input controller interprets the, no, no, no. Maybe. No. No, I use the same repeat rate. I think this is wrong. This should be in a separate timer. I mean, it works, because I don't have a way to disable game pads. They're always just on. I have another project where gamepad support is optional and isn't always initialized at startup. Therefore, input controller repeating wouldn't work because that would never get called. Okay, so that's... Uh, Another thing for me to adjust. All right, finding all these little uh, dusty corners that have, you know, dust that I need to clean in them. <laughs> Things slightly out of out of order. Uh, and there's a reason I want to pull for whether a gamepad has been connected or disconnected at a lower rate than if the connected gamepad has had a state change that's important to me. Like, I want to know about that instantly. Like, user presses a button, I want to know about it. So I need, that's a much higher pull rate then, uh, yeah, so gamepad timer interval is 60 times a second. Gamepad detect devices interval is five times a second, uh, which is still pretty fast. It's more than fast enough to feel responsive. You know, you plug in a gamepad, you have to wait a fifth of a second. That's, you know, so little time. Like Windows takes a moment to realize that you've plugged in a gamepad or unplugged it. I think unplugging is actually instant. Yeah, unplugging is instant. Plugging in a new one takes a moment sometimes. So yeah, uh, time between plugging in a gamepad and the game realizing you've done it and uh, um, uh, allowing it to be used for input uh, could be up to an extra fifth of a second because of this. But anyway, yeah, so just, there, there were performance reasons once. I think there aren't anymore, but there are there there were once and this is reasonable. Anyway, yeah, so it, uh, it pulls for connected gamepad events. Um, that's a confusing way to phrase that. It pulls for events that come from gamepads that are already connected 60 times per second and pulls for new gamepads being connected uh, five times a second. Anyway, yeah. And uh, right, we talked about this. This just says, uh, I don't want VSync on because that causes me some latency and problems in certain circumstances, but I don't want to draw just as fast as your computer possibly can because that will waste CPU time for no uh, visible effect. So I say at the screen's refresh rate, I want, yeah, I want one call per screen refresh rate approximately. And Shell has a mechanism for this. We looked at this in detail, so you know how this works. <laughs> uh, and that's all the setup I do here, unless we're on Android, which we never will be. That's just some extra stuff for, oh, Android, but not iOS. Okay, sure. Yeah, I haven't built for iOS in like a very long time. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to do it these days. Uh, right, but if we're not on a pocket computer, then set the full screen setting according to game sessions thing. Yeah, so the window opens and then it goes full screen if the preference has been set. The uh, the alt enter shortcut doesn't set the preference. So if I if I do this, and I alt enter and I quit and I open again. It doesn't open in full screen. But if I do this, uh, full screen, yes. I quit, I open, then it does it at startup. And that did it so quick I didn't even see the window open. Sure, that makes sense because that's still in the same function call that initially opened the window. Yes, okay. Uh, anyway, so then we call shell main loop. So we're not quite done with throw rock initialization. This is just done the most basic stuff so that it can erase the window to black. Um, all of this was necessary set up for that to happen. I, that's not strictly true, but it kind of was, more or less. I could do less if I needed to. This is little enough. Uh, so shell main loop. 
Uh, we've looked at what that does. Eventually, target draw is going to get called. And uh, the system that I have here is I need to have at least one draw so I know I've cleared the window to black before I'm going to do my more expensive initialization stuff uh, on top of that. So let's see. Yeah, so here's the clear to black. Render a clear color, transparent black. Uh, Redisplay, handle is true. Uh, I've done an initial draw. There was a time when I had a reason for this to be a higher value. It's not currently, but anyway. Wait, no. No, no, that's two, because those are added together. Anyway, this is old code. It's kind of hacky. I had some reasons for doing this. Um, a lot of things are complicated, and this is one that is. Anyway, yeah, so uh, a couple of iterations of target draw are going to be called. So this drew a black window that at some point after that had happened, uh, I'm going to say, okay, I know my window has been initialized to the color that I want. Therefore, I can take a moment to do things that might be expensive and init after first draw. Uh, then I'm going to draw black again and do those things. This seems weird. This seems like it does an extra... Hmm. I could probably go straight from here to the normal handling of target draw. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, yeah, so init after first draw. So here's the second part of initialization. So here's where levels are loaded and stuff. Uh, so we're loading some renderer stuff. We'll look at this in detail when we talk about a renderer. Game session, load deferred resources. Here we go, this one is important. Game session. So second call to game session initialization. This is a lot shorter. Uh, load the texture atlas, interface.atlas. Oh, what's in this? The font, and only the font. Okay, so this is just loading the font. Uh, UI widgets like checkboxes, uh, radio buttons, etc., would be in here if I had any of those, but I don't. I'm not using that UI subsystem for anything other than text rendering. Yeah, so the font, um, right, so that's the texture atlas that contains the character glyphs, but the information about how to draw them as text is in a separate file, so I reference that resource. Yeah, so this uh, calls those resource manager callbacks that I talked about in resource wiring and, you know, deserializes, deserializes the JSON file of uh, this bitmap font. Um, if you want more details about this, uh, that's in my Foresight Fight devlog where I go over it. But anyway, this is just specifying how to draw those glyphs. Um, if I have an exclamation point character, this is, ooh, that's a high precision decimal value. Uh, this is how much it advances. Uh, this is how wide it is. That's the key I can reference it by. This is what the kerning is, if it has any, which it doesn't, etc. Anyway. Uh, so, right. Get the texture atlas, get the font. Um, oh, these are absolutely not applicable to throw rock because I don't show any UI buttons. So this could be deleted. Sure. Sounds good. I, right, so button text padding, button icon padding, button slices. Yeah, none of that is relevant in any way. So I just want the font height. That's literally it. Uh, UI appearance create. Again, this is a subsystem that's just not actually used by Throw Rock, but it was easier to initialize it than not to just because it's it's where the font lives. So just, just think of this as initializing text rendering. Load the font, get it ready. Uh, you also are irrelevant. Yes, that goes away. Great. Okay, um, so that works. So, uh, oh, that's all. Okay, so this literally just loads the font. Great, nice and simple. Not much to think about. Uh, and then more renderer setup. I tell it where to find the font when it needs to render it, but we'll, we'll get to that in detail. Uh, now, here's some interesting stuff. File bundle. Right, yes, okay, the tile set is a file bundle. Oh, geez, do I have to unpack a file bundle? That's complicated to do. I could do it if I have to. Let's not. <laughs> uh, this is a document created by tile editor, which contains the, uh, right, we looked at this when, uh, when I went over the graphics, so you know, you know what I'm talking about, but real quick, I can go here to tile editor. Uh, tools, tile editor, 
uh, have a build here, I'm sure. Let's hope it works. It looks like it does, whoops. Uh, this will have changed since you last saw it. But don't worry too much about that. I'll talk about it in detail in a different video. Um, I want throw rock resources, throw rock dot tile set. So this one file, oops, uh, contains all of the, uh, right, I don't want that. Contains all the tiles uh, that are used to draw the, the game. So this is both the texture atlas that contains these and the information of, um, of like what their name is, what their ID is, what their auto tiling is, if any, but this doesn't have that. Um, so it's that file. Uh, yeah, that's stored in file bundle format. Again, covered in Foresight Fight Devlog. Don't want to go over it here. It's just a, uh, that's part of the file format. Uh, so yeah, it contains an image, contains texture atlas data. I pre-multiply the image because it's stored non-pre-multiplied for this, but if there's any transparency, which there is, here's some. Uh, pre-multiplication is important for rendering, and again, we'll go over that when we get to the renderer, maybe. Uh, create the atlas object, so that's what knows where to find these in the... Let's see, could I... I'd have to unpack the file bundle to see what the actual tile uh, texture atlas ping looks like. And I don't feel like doing that. You know, it's it looks like... Uh, just imagine this thing, but with basically these in a layout something like this, but a little different so they don't overlap in it. And it's the data of like what region counts as which, which tile. Anyway, uh, so with all that loaded and set for rendering, I can dispose of the transient objects that were used for loading it. Okay, so we loaded the tile set. Uh, if audio is enabled, then I want to play at, I believe I set this to 48,000 hertz by default. Is that in globals? It is not. Is that in this file? It is not. Haven't I already searched this out? Is it in shared definitions? No, it's in sounds. Here we go, that makes sense. Audio sample rate, 48,000. Uh, so my audio system can operate at different sample rates. This is the one I choose by default. I could have a preference for this. Um, because if your system outputs 44,100, then me outputting at 48,000 is not ideal. There'll be some resampling artifacts, uh, but that's not a preference that I bothered to put in for Throw Rock. Other applications I make may have that preference. Audio Lab does. Uh, anyway, yeah, so initialize audio player 16. What's that? Let's find out. So audio player is my API that plays audio, obviously. Um, we call the initial, oh, that is a uh, long. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's thoroughly documented. All right, so here's the description. Read that if you want. Uh, source count max, stream count max, category count, sample format, callback, callback, context. Sure. Uh, so I'm saying 16 sounds can be playing at the same time. One audio stream can be playing at the same time, and that is just for the background music. I don't play two musics at the same time. I don't have anything else that operates with the same mechanism as music, so one is enough. Uh, what is it? Two channels? No, two categories. There are two uh, categories of audio that I can adjust the levels of individually. So I actually tell audio player what I want my sound effect volume and my music volume to be. So that's establishing those two categories as things whose levels I can adjust individually. Uh, this is the sample format I want. This is, uh, let's see, an audio out sample format. It's actually in a separate... Is that in here? It's not. That's actually in a separate library. Native audio. Audio out. I don't know if I'll do a dedicated audio programming episode for this. Um, I'm not going to go into it in detail right now. This is just game initialization. So channel count, sample rate, bytes per sample. So I say I want two channels, stereo, 48,000 hertz, and um, data format of 16-bit integer, two byte, uh, in case that matters. Uh, and when I tell you to play a sound effect, you will call this callback, 
reference sound effect, which is actually defined in resource wiring. Uh, so how do I play a sound like this? I call sound effect, audio player, play sound effect, atom of the sounds identifier, audio category sound. Uh, so that determines the volume level is set in the preferences. This determines which sound is played. So then in the atom list, we have like, oh, interesting, these don't have a prefix. Okay, so like all levels complete, bump, freeze, those are sound identifiers. Those correspond to the names of like bump.stem audio, all levels complete.stem audio. Uh, so that's how I reference those both in code and on disk. Um, so yeah, reference sound effect here in resource wiring knows which file it wants to load. It just references that in resource manager. Yeah, so these identifiers all happen to line up. So I can just say, I want the stem audio identified by this identifier. And it knows how to go get that and synthesize it with my audio lab audio synth system. So parse the binary file, create a synth configuration out of it, uh, use that synth configuration to make uh, uncompressed PCM audio in memory that can be sent to the audio out device at two channels, one, one what? I don't know, one something. Uh, or sorry, no, two bytes per sample, one channel because these are all mono audio. I don't know. Anyway, audio sample rate, etc. It It sets, sets the audio memory, uh, audio sample data in memory for, for playback. Uh, so yeah, whenever I tell audio player to play something, it goes and gets it if it's not already loaded and uh, synthesizes it and then can send it to the, the audio device. Uh, this just um, frees that if I ever am done with... Interesting, I wonder if that's called... Yeah, okay. Uh, memory management stuff. It's not really applicable. I think basically each sound effect is loaded and synthesized once the first time I want to play it, which might not be ideal. I could tell it to do it ahead of time here in in it after first draw. That'd be a good place to do it. I just call resource manager reference sound effect for every one of uh, every one of these. Then those would all load at once on startup. Take that performance hit there rather than taking it when. Uh, when you actually need to play a sound, which is timing sensitive, in case that were important. A better way to do that, and I'm going into hypothetical here, a better way to do that would be to start a thread uh, that doesn't block my main thread and synthesize these uh, one at a time so that they'll be ready when I need them, but I don't have to like wait for all the synthesis to complete all at once. Anyway, yeah, so hypotheticals, um, that's not what actually happens. So yeah, when I want to play a sound for the first time, it synthesizes it, loads it from disk and synthesizes it, and uh, then it's just ready for use later. Uh, set the category volume, yeah, so if sound is disabled, sound effects are zero volume. If it's enabled, then there whatever volume is set in the preferences. Uh, yeah, this is all fine. Um, game session... Yeah, so this is what I was talking about where game session is the API barrier for preferences. Get sound volume here actually talks to preferences and uses its API for getting the value of the key, getting the actual um, in memory value out of the dynamic type here. So I say I'm expecting this to be an 8-bit unsigned integer and I want the unsigned int value of it. Then return that as the value if it's in range if it's out of range then return the maximum so like if you go into your preferences file and you know type in 200 as the volume you won't get you know 2000 percent uh audio just like blasting your ears off um it'll max out it, its actual maximum uh so there are safeguards and yeah just divide that by 10 as a float because that's the uh the range of audio player set category volume is zero to one. And same thing for music. Uh, don't pause the audio device if nothing is playing, just so you, you sort of keep it hot. Uh, if the music is paused and there are no sound effects going right now, just so it can immediately start playing again. 
Uh, yeah, that's... Hmm. I'm not sure if this is necessary. It kind of depends on the audio API and other things. Uh, but just, just to be sure. Um, and right, then I set up the audio timer. Right, I just copied and pasted this from the other function. Okay, so audio is initialized. Um, tile set is loaded. Graphics are ready. Uh, I create this one single game screen, the one and only one that is used. Uh, so that's just a matter of event flow and management. Uh, doesn't really matter much, although it kind of does. So game screen create is going to do a bunch of stuff, or game screen init rather. Yeah, this creates a pause menu object. Uh, UI container, that's not relevant. You're not used, are you? You try to be used, but there's nothing actually in you. Okay, so I have on screen a container for UI elements, but I never put anything in it. Yeah, okay, so this is leftover code from where I copied from. Like if I wanted to put a button on screen in like this UI system that I'm using here, or like a menu bar or something, I would add it to that container, but but I don't add anything. So this this actually does nothing. All right, so that could be removed, but I'd have to remove a bunch of other stuff to, to actually take it out of there. Uh, render layer, this is graphic stuff, we'll get to that. Renderable graphic stuff, we'll get to that. You don't start paused. Uh, when I create the screen, it's not active, but that's irrelevant. Right, there's no undo tree right away, but I will initialize that. Okay, undo stuff, not done yet. Level properties, level properties? What's level properties? Uh, okay, so scrolls and wiring, the uh, the extra information that doesn't fit in the um, the tile set. So I call that stuff level properties, the, the JSON file that uh, says like this pressure plate is wired to this door and stuff. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to find a stopping point because I'm uh, fatiguing a bit here. This is, this is a lot to go over. So where was I? Game screen. Right, the mouse over tile, the one that is, well, <laughs> not in this program, but it looks kind of like this. Uh, the place where the mouse is that highlights. Uh, and then load a level. Right, load the level that was um, specified as the level to load. All right, so load level. That's a chunky little function. Um, let's be satisfied with just saying that it loads the level, and we'll go over this in more detail later, uh, how it actually does that. Uh, so at a high level, the game screen is initialized and it loads the first level. Uh, or whichever level is the appropriate one to start up at. Uh, then I deserialize something else. What am I looking at? The music, right. Load the music, synthesize the music. I guess I'm doing this without the resource. Manager thing? Wait, why am I doing this? Interesting, so I never call... I have this in here twice. Music sequence create, audio sequence. Audio sequence composite, music sequence deserialize. Yeah, that's the same thing I'm doing here, isn't it? Yeah, I have duplicate code. Whoops, okay. So I never call the resource wiring version of music parsing. I just do it here. All right, well, that's the same thing. Uh, apparently. Right, create an audio stream in a way that audio player understands and tell it to start playing. So I, uh, right, so once I've drawn the black window so that I know I'm, I'm ready to uh, do stuff. Initialize graphics, load tile set, initialize audio, initialize game screen and level, uh, load music, start music. Then I return from this and uh, from there, I'm just listening to user inputs and uh, responding to them and doing game logic and stuff. Music is playing, uh, target draw is being called periodically. Uh, right, and this, uh, right, renders to the low resolution thing, tells the current screen, which is game screen, which is the only screen to draw itself. Uh, yeah, we'll go over this when we do graphics stuff, graphics programming stuff. 
Um, this is absolutely irrelevant to you. So I could delete it because there's only one screen. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do that. And right, then actually draw that render target to the screen at its uh, at its blown up size. This is not throw rock, but you know, pretend it is. <laughs> and uh, memory management stuff. And then then we're done with a draw iteration. So we've drawn one frame of the game, although I haven't gone over some of the details that happen in there. Okay, so we're getting there. Building up this uh, this idea of how the application executes. So I've explained everything that happens except for level loading. And then after this, we'll get into like input processing and game logic and stuff. Okay, is this too thorough? I don't know, I hope it's interesting to some of you at least. Uh, I want to be thorough because, I don't know, I find this interesting and uh, I like to share. I think it's cool. All right, I made a bunch of code changes here that probably won't compile, but that's going to be my problem for later. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll see you next time to get into uh, core game logic, level loading, stuff like that.